Welcome and Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. So nice to see you all here. Hopefully we'll still have a, a few uh, more people uh, wandering in. Um, but it's nice to see all your wonderful, smiling, happy faces. I hope everyone's preparations are all ready. You're all set. Uh, whether it's going home tonight and starting to uh, celebrate Christmas or if you're going to wait till, till the morning. But it's a, a wonderful <coughs> opportunity to come together and to worship and to welcome back into the world once more our Savior. So I hope you enjoyed tonight's service. Uh, as, as we traditionally do, it's heavy on music, heavy on reading, light on me. So uh, I hope you enjoy it.
to the lighting of the Advent wreath and the Christ King. <coughs> O Holy One, center of all of our lives, in all times, past, present, and future, we light this candle in token that you are which our lives circle about. You are our focus and our compass, our strength and our purpose. We pray that it shall ever be so in all the days to come until we join with you in establishing the dwelling in heaven on the new earth. Amen. 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 Oh yeah, we got two firemen in the building. Three firemen in the building. We're covered.
Our second reading comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, found on page 54 in the New Testament of your Pew Bibles. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Curianus was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who pledged to be married to him and expecting a child. While they were there, the, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest rooms available for them. And there were shepherds living out on, in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherd said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see the thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. If you are able, please stand and join us in Angels We Have Heard on High, found on page 238 in your hymnals.
turn your hymnals to page 217. We're going to sing the next hymnal, the next instinct scene. As we invite the children to come up and meet me at the manger. Because we have a very special thing to do now. Oh, no, we're not going to sit. Sure. <laughs> Stand for this one. All right, which one of you is the youngest? The youngest gets the honor. Oh, oh the little guys are coming. Come on. Come on, the other guys. Younger than you. All right. Oh, okay, one changes mine. All right. Maybe mom's going to be able to help you with this. I'm going to give that to you, and you two can do this for us. As we start singing away in the manger, you'll notice we put our manger up over a month ago, about a month ago, but it's missing something, right? Some very important thing right there in the center. What's it missing? Jesus. That's right. You've got to yell these things out when you know the answers. You're a smart lad, an intelligent lad, to use the line from Scrooge. That's right. Jesus isn't in the manger because he doesn't show up there till tonight. So this is the night that we put Jesus in the manger. So can we do that right there in the center? Right here, right in his bed, put him right there, lay him in there. Oh, perfect, thank you, perfect, thank you. All right, <laughs> high five, good boy. And let's sing, we can sing Away in the Manger. No, you don't sing, no, okay, yes. You guys can go back to your seats, it's all right, thank you.
Our third reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses through to 7, found on page 600 in the Old Testament section of your hymn Bible. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who live in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of meeting. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And our Please stand up if you're able and join in the hymn, O Come All Ye Faithful, number 234. In your <laughs>
found on page one of the New Testament and going into page two. The visit of the wise men. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who had been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men, and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that had been seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. And our fourth reading hymn, What Child Is This? Page 219. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Stand the baby. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of thought you knew that by now. Airways. Oh, if you want to sit, sit. If you're tired, you did a lot of standing already. That's okay to sit.
please be seated. So, when I was standing with the kids by the manger, something odd caught my attention. Did anyone, when they came in this evening, happen to look at the manger and see something different? Did, did, did Mama Courtney thought, see something? Did the kids? No, huh? Well, part of the, the thing that we just read is that, according to the Bible, the wise men actually don't make an appearance at the manger. But it would be a kind of a smaller set if they, they weren't there, so traditionally they've always included them. They actually show up about two years later at the house that Mary and Joseph are living in. But we have the, we have the wise men here tonight. So it's not that. It's something else. It's something to do... Oh, there it is. It's with the donkey. No, it's not a blanket, but it looks like a blanket. That's right. Those are his ears. <laughs> He's got very, very, very long ears for a donkey. He's got ears that go down to the ground. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about that donkey and his ears because much to my surprise this year, this is one of my favorite Christmas stories, much to my surprise this year, when I was talking to some people about this song, about this story, they looked at me and went, huh? <coughs> I'm like, you don't know about Nestor, the long-eared donkey? Like, never heard of him. And that was probably, because about 30 years ago, this story was written, and they made an animated version of it with Rankin and Bass, and it was pretty popular on TV for a number of Christmases, but it's kind of faded, they don't really show it very often. So a lot of you younger kids have probably never heard of Nestor, have you? No? And even some of the older people may not have seen the story. So I'm going to tell you right off the beginning, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> this is not a story that's in the Bible. And some people will say, well, it couldn't be. Nestor talks. So in, in the animals talk, how can that be in the Bible? Do you know there's a donkey who talks in the Bible? Yep. Belonged to a priest, a man named Balaam. And if you don't believe me, in the next day or two, I'm going to fall, the next day or two, you go home and read Numbers 22, 23, and 24. And you're going to read a story about a man named Balaam, and part of the story is about his donkey that talked. Basically kept telling him, don't hit me. And Balaam beat his donkey, and the donkey kept saying, don't hit me. So the Bible does have talking animals. So that's not really too far a stretch for the Bible. But this isn't a true story. It is a Christmas story. And Jesus loved stories. He loved them so much that a lot of his teachings were done with stories. We call them parables. Parables is just a fancy name for a story. Some of the parables were based on true events. But not all. A lot of them were just made up stories that Jesus used to get his point across. This doesn't make them any less important just because they were made up stories. We tell a lot of stories as pastors, some of which are true, some of which we don't know if they're true or not, and others which we just know aren't true. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that type of story. This is a not true story, but it's still a beautiful one. And it has a lovely Christian Christmas message in it, and a message that really talks about the life of Christ. So Nestor was born with these huge ears all the way down to his toes. He was a funny-looking donkey. He was always stepping on his toes. He was always tripping over them. And the other donkeys and the animals in the barnyard all made fun of him. He was kind of the Rudolph Red-Nosed Reindeer of his day. But Nestor's mom, of course, she loved him. Because hopefully all moms love their children. And she, she adored him. But it came a day... When a Roman soldier was coming by the, the stable where Nestor and the other animals lived, and he was going to buy a bunch of donkeys from the owner for the army. And Nestor's ears at this time were hidden. And the soldier buys them, and all of a sudden he realizes, what a funny, sorry-looking animal this is, with these huge ears that are all the way old. He's, I can't use him. What are you trying to sell the emperor a defective donkey for? So he won't take them. In fact, he's not even going to pay for the rest of the animals. He's just going to take all the animals he wants and leave this 
silly looking nester behind. Well, this gets the, the owner very upset because he's had a lot of money. So he takes Nestor by his ears and he throws him out into the snow. He says, ah, I'm done with you. I don't care what happens to you. And it's a storm. Nestor could die. And he's wandering around and he's looking for some place that he could find shelter when his mom shows up. She managed to get out because she's going to go take care of her little boy. So she digs a place for him to sleep and she puts him in it to keep him warm. But the snow is just, it's too cold. There's no way you know, he's going to survive. So she covers him. All but his ears. His ears, she can't do anything about. But she covers him with his body. In the morning, storm's over, and Nestor's fine. But Mama, she died. Who's that sound? Who's that sound like? That was our parent. And what they did for us. That's starting to sound a little bit like a Christmas story, an Easter story, a Jesus story. Because that's what Christ does for us, right? Christ goes to the cross so that we don't have to. Now, when Ben came in this evening, he said, Christ is risen. And we were all teasing him. No, no, that's an Easter saying. But it's also a Christmas saying. Christ is risen. Because Christ doesn't stay dead. Christ dies for us so that we don't have to. But then he rises. And this is the beginning of that story. This is where his great story, the greatest story ever told, begins. But that's not the only Christian message in the story of Nestor. There's so much more. It's filled with it. So Nestor survives and he grows up to be an adult donkey with, again, those funny, funny long years. And along the years, he makes a friend, a little angel. And most people can't hear the angel because their voices are so tiny and small. But again, he's got these huge ears. So he can actually hear the angels. And this is going to be important. He's going to need to be able to hear the angels. Because the day comes, he's owned by a different man, that a man and a woman come to the stable where he is, and they need a donkey. The woman is very, very, very pregnant. And they have to travel a great distance, and there's no way she's going to be able to walk it. So she needs an animal to ride. She needs a donkey that she can ride. And they fall in love with Nestor because he's got gentle eyes. These soft, huge, precious moment eyes. And they say, that's the one we want. We don't care about his ears. We want him. So they choose Nestor. And, of course, you can probably guess the man's name is Joseph. The woman, Mary. So they set off to Bethlehem so that they can take part in the census as they're ordered to. But not long after they leave the stable where Nestor was staying, a terrible storm comes up, a desert storm. And the star, the star of Bethlehem, which they were using to find their way, they can't see it anymore. And there are no real roads, so there's nothing for them to follow. They're going to get lost, and they're going to die in the desert. But the angels, they know the way. So they start telling Nestor where to go. Ears, he can hear them. So he starts taking them towards Bethlehem. And because his ears are so big, He's able to not only hear the angels, but he can wrap them around Mary and keep her safe from the storm. Why does God do that? Because he does it throughout the Bible. He's done it in your life. Here's the next part of the message, right? God uses the broken and the least people among us to accomplish amazing things. We see it all the time. People who we don't even think could survive, who become wonderful servants of God. He takes Moses, who's a stutterer and a murderer, and he makes him a prophet to his people in Israel. He takes Paul, who's killing the new Jew Christians by the hundreds, and he turns him into his 
disciple to replace Judas. He takes David, who's just this tiny little shepherd boy, and he puts him up against a giant. And the reason God does this, the reason God uses Nestor in the story, is because when the least succeed, when the ones who can't win, despite the odds, and against all odds, manage to triumph, it's God who gets the glory. Because that's where the glory belongs, not to us, to God. What's amazing is not what we can do in our brokenness, it's what God can do through us in our brokenness. There's none of us, not even the little ones, who can't serve God and who God can't use. That's the second part of the Christmas message. We all have value and we have worth in the eyes of God. And that's why he came to us that night. So they get to Bethlehem, and you know the story at this point, right? There's no room at the inn. There's no place for them to stay. But Nestor remembers something. He remembers how warm and comforting a stable can be if you're with your mom. And baby Jesus will be with his mother Mary. So he leads them to the stable. And Mary puts him in the manger. <coughs> And the animals flock around him and keep him warm with their body heat. The straw and the hay keep him warm. She wraps him in those swallowing clothes to keep him warm. And the shepherds come. And they witness the glory of Christ. And this is where the last part of the story teaches us the lessons Christ wants to, us to learn. And probably, probably, for us today, this is the most important lesson. Tolerance and acceptance of those who are different. Because there's no doubt Nestor was different from every other donkey in creation. No other donkey had ears like this guy. And he was ridiculed and mocked and laughed at. But God used him to do a remarkable thing. To save himself. To save God. Right now, as we sit here, for all we know, another Mary and another Joseph are trying to bring a baby into this country. That might be the second coming of Jesus. Because we know he's coming, but we don't know where and we don't know when. But it could be happening right now. And just because they may look different, or because they may have a different culture than us, or they may speak a different language, or they may be poor or have no skills, do we want to be the nation and the people that put a sign up on the Statue of Liberty that says, we're sorry, the door is closed, there's no room in our country. There's a song that's written about that, and it's a beautiful song. It's written, while you were sleeping. America, while you were sleeping. Your king showed up. Did you realize it? And did you let him in? There's a flash mob video. You can look it up on Facebook. Done in the Mall of Americas. A couple of years ago. It's one of my favorite. I watch it every year. And it's about Christmas. They do all kinds of carols, all the ones we just sang. And at the end, they have a Mary and a Joseph walk in through the crowd with a baby. Now that's a beautiful painting of Christ. I, I know the man who did it, the, the group of people who did it, and it's lovely. But that's not what Christ looked like, folks. That's a beautiful German Christ. Tall Aryan, blue eyes, blonde hair, clean, proud and regal looking. Yeah. You know, the couple they got to portray this were short. They were dark haired, scraggly looking, fairly large nose, 
They looked like a typical Jewish person or an Arab. They looked a lot more like the men who flew the planes into the buildings on 9-11 than they would ever look like that. Because that's where Christ came from. That's his heritage. That was his earthly mother and his adopted earthly father. And we can't say no to them just because they make us uncomfortable. Or they make us think they're different. Because then we're saying no to Christ. So tolerance and acceptance of all people. That's our Christmas challenge. And if we embrace it, and if we take up that gauntlet and we do it, that's our Christmas gift to the world. If we want to be Christmas people, we have to love the nesters. We have to love the silly looking and the funny sounding and the strange custom people. And we have to make room for them because God knows we have enough room here. We do not lack for a space. So let's not close our country. Let's not shut our doors and say there's no room at the inn. Because we might just be shutting out Christ. And I don't think any of us want to do that. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now is our opportunity to return to God a portion of that which he has blessed us with on this special Christmas. So I'll leave it up to, uh, to what you would like to do. 
we can go outside to sing Silent Night, or if, we're, if it's a little cold and we want to stay warm, we can stay inside and sing. What do you think? Stay inside? <laughs> I kind of love that bike being Meryl and folks, because she came in and said, I'm cold. All right, so we're going to stay inside and stay where it's warm. Um, we're going to ask Ed to come up and light his candle off of the Christ candle, and then he will walk down the aisles on one side, I'll walk down the other side, and we will uh, light the candles off of the Christ candle, off the candle given to you. Please, if you have the unlit candle, tilt it towards the lit candle. That way it will keep the wax from falling all over the place.
last hymn of the evening, 246, Joy to the World, Rise if you're in. <coughs> this one we got to sing with Gus. <laughs> Thank you. 